Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to have you all here uh, after uh, a really good uh, stage X uh, during lunch. Um, you know, we are actually missing one person, so hopefully she will, Mercedes will come soon, but we will get going in the meantime. This panel is about the path to a trillion dollar ad tech company. Um, you know, it's a surprising phrase to hear, but you know, lately we've been living in times of acceleration. Uh, we have seen a lot of value creation in broader technology, consumer technology, and over the last three, four years, especially catalyzed through COVID, we've seen acceleration in education and ad tech. And I'm glad that uh, we have to, <laughs> we're just about to start. <laughs> no problem. Hi, I'm Mercedes. <laughs> so I'm joined here by a group of uh, world-class investors, Shoshana Vernick with Avaton uh, Partners, who is both um, kind of a VC and also PE type of investor with minority and majority uh, investments. Um, Kristin Bannon from SoftBank. Uh, all of you know SoftBank has been a very large and important player, both in broader consumer technology and also in ad tech, and, and Kristin is leading the ad tech focus for SoftBank. Larry Oak, um, CEO of uh, Process Ventures, um, who initially Process before we used to be Naspers, and Larry already started uh, the venture activity for Naspers many, many years ago. And then Mercedes Band from Lightspeed, um, you know, a kind of a early to mid-stage venture-focused uh, firm that's been very successful both in the U.S. and in India, and also uh, focused on Lightspeed's ad tech investments. Um, you know, myself, I'm a partner at GSV, co-founder of GSV, and uh, yeah, looking forward to this great panel. So maybe to start first, uh, if each one of you could uh, talk a little bit about the reason you are all investing in education and ad tech and kind of the thesis you have behind that. Shushala, maybe I'll start with you. Well, hello. I don't think I've been in a room seeing this many people from the nose down in a very long time. Um, and it's fantastic to be on a panel with um, three ladies and two men. So, <laughs> 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 So why this space, right? I think um, I'll speak for myself, but I suspect I probably share the same um, heartfelt remarks of all of you. I think I've entered this space as the daughter of a second grade school teacher and a, and a daughter of a, of a rising entrepreneur and my father. And when I think about the difference that education made in our household and the opportunity to get ahead by working hard and, and using education to our power, you know, that has stayed with me for, for my whole life and something that I hope to be able to pass down, not just to my family, but for all the organizations that we're a part of, really driving forward the mission of those businesses. And so from our perspective, you don't have to sacrifice mission in order to build an amazing business that creates margin. And so finding the power of both, where you have real clarity to purpose in those organizations, you're delivering the product and service to those that need it most, and then articulating and, and architecting a business model that allows for innovation to be fueled and for really a difference to be made at scale. That's what keeps us uh, motivated every day and determined to make a difference. That's great, yeah, and, and I would second that, that we're in a unique opportunity to not just deliver financial returns for our um, investors, but in addition to do support companies that are, are doing great things for the world. And so uh, at SoftBank, we're investing out of Vision Fund 2, which is $51 billion of committed capital, and uh, education technology companies are a big part of what we're looking for um, to support and, and invest behind. And so at a high level, uh, from a founder perspective, uh, Masa looks to invest in founders that have big, bold visions that are disrupting technology, that are using technology to disrupt industries and sectors. Um, and me personally, my, my lens on education technology is looking at companies that, and investing in companies that are a key part of, of ecosystem and the educational ecosystem in general. So supporting all of the constituents in it, particularly the consumer. And so an example of that uh, could be one of my uh, portfolio companies, class.com, who I know is here today, that is uh, you know, really revolutionizing the experience for, um, for learners and, so, uh, and also augmenting the experience 
requirements of, of live learning for instructors as well. And so really changing that, um, changing, using technology to change that experience and, and make it better for the consumer is a key part of my thesis. Yeah, and it's uh, going to be hard to, well, sorry, I hit myself with a mic, um, to, to follow that because our story is very similar. We're um, a global technology investor with a focus on uh, consumer internet, and we look at big sectors of um, consumer wallet yet to be disrupted by technology, and you know, education would clearly follow, fall in that bucket. Um, obviously, we come with a, maybe not obvious, we come with a, a developing market lens. Um, we've, to date, we first looked at education starting 2014, 2015. We've deployed about three and a half billion in capital across a dozen, um, dozen companies, again, with the lens primarily on consumer and over time moving more towards the enterprise. My story in terms of <clears throat> how I got into it, um, there's both the personal and the professional. On the personal side, you know, my grandparents were all first generation college goers and the, went, they went to HBCUs, uh, historically black colleges and universities. Half of my grandparents are rural south descendant of slaves and the other half had immigrated from Colombia and Bermuda. And they were really interested in the power of education and it's just been drilled into my family ever since. They ended up becoming professors and teaching at Virginia State University um, until the end of their, their time. And so it's always been such a core part of my family that education is a great equalizer. And, you know, a decade ago, I started working at General Assembly. And um, we were, you know, I thought I might go for a year, kind of like get tech, you know, business education, learn about product management, user experience design. But I just fell in love with what we were doing, the work we were transforming for students' lives. There was a kid, Matt, who I found out was sleeping at the school, and we realized he didn't have a place to sleep, he didn't have a home. We put him into a, a kind of a work-study program that we were doing. He ended up graduating, you know, getting a six-figure software engineering job, and I was like, I can't leave this industry. This is the best industry in the world. And so at Lightspeed, you know, venture partners, we're a 17 billion AUM fund, and we're investing all over the globe. We're investors in Baiju's Handshake, Multiverse, Forge, uh, many others, Clever as well. And we are just so excited about the sector. I think across K-12, adult learning, post-secondary, lifelong learning, we haven't done too much in early childhood, but I'd say we're really excited about anything that's transforming people's lives and helping that really difficult journey be a little bit easier. Great. Yeah, and the theme of the summit this year is we are on the edge, ed education is on the edge, ed on the edge, and obviously, you know, we are on the edge of seeing a lot of transformative ideas that can scale dramatically. Just to give you some context, um, when we launched the summit in 2009, um, you know, we, I was just mentioning here to some of the panelists, we were 120 people in, uh, at ASU at a small campus, um, you know, and had a few entrepreneurs. But basically looking at what's, what's developed over the last decade, in 2010 there was only about 500 million invested in net tech. Uh, there were two IPOs of education companies, no unicorns. You know, 2019, just before the pandemic hit, there were 10 unicorns, uh, 7 billion in venture capital invested in the space. And then fast forward today, 2021 was a record year with 21 billion invested. We now have 51 unicorns in the ed tech space and actually two decacorns, if you exclude some of the Chinese companies that no longer count as, as, as decacorns. So clearly, you know, dramatic changes and a lot of value creation. Obviously, getting to a trillion dollar company is a long, long way from here, knowing that Baiju's is a 22 billion valuation and that is the largest market cap company today uh, in the ad tech space. But let's think about getting to a hundred billion dollar. And, you know, what will be the, that company, what characteristics will that company have to get there? And maybe talk about just what you're looking for when you make these this really big bets on these companies that you believe will be successes, big success stories that will be also pulling the sector. I'll start with Mercedes. I think it's um, really difficult to build uh, businesses that have operational complexity that are, if you think about universities, there's tons of them, there's 6,500 in the US or so, and if you add up all of the revenue of all of them, I don't know, it might be over 100 billion, that's quite large. I think that the 
thing I think about though is those are very operationally complex businesses with low gross margins. I've tried to scale them. You know, the biggest one, University of Phoenix, got to 600,000 students per year, and of course, the outcomes were not that good. I think outcomes are really, really, really hard to scale at that that scale. So when I think about what could be a hundred billion dollar company, I think through what is a digital first experience that is both probably consumer and enterprise that is maybe not actually thought of as a ed tech company. Um, you know, if you think about where we're spending our time, every company is competing to be on your home screen app. It's competing to be kind of that first two pages that you're looking at constantly. There's a lot of social platforms. There's a lot of financial platforms that could all have learning experiences. And I think what I'm really looking for is thinking about learning companies, not just as verticalized solo. I am explicitly offering you a learning experience, but what's a horizontal play that goes across all sorts of apps that we're interacting acting with every day. I still haven't seen a company built like this that is at the consumer facing end, but I do think that could be something that gets there. Well, arguably, YouTube has that model and it has been very educationally oriented as has also Roblox, which is a, I think today is a 40 or $50 billion company, but yes, very, very correct. Well, that's soft. <laughs> sure. I mean, YouTube is an interesting segue. So uh, we're, uh, I'm an investor in a company called Spotter, which uh, finances YouTube creators. And I'm, every day I'm, I'm blown away by the educational content of the, num the quantum of videos that they own in this space. And so they have hundreds of thousands of videos uh, that are focused on, I would say, pre-K uh, specifically, and, and they get millions and millions of views a day. And so when you think about how we consume content and, and the access to information, it's completely different than when I was growing up. And I think that's really exciting. It really democratizes um, education in general. And I think that's, that's a very exciting path for the industry. And then just kind of touching on the, the question of a $100 billion company, um, you know, I think education is unique in the sense that it touches a consumer throughout your life cycle, right? So um, it is very important for kind of through, from pre-K through older demographics. And when you think about LTVs, that's a very attractive long-term op opportunity. And so I think companies that address the full spectrum of that consumer life cycle um, will be the first to reach the $100, $100 billion mark. Uh, I think on the flip side, too, you need to be fast growing and, and connected to all different parts of the ecosystem. So there can't just be one beneficiary. It's, it's really being an integral layer, kind of what Mercedes was talking about, across kind of horizontally across applications um, and supporting multiple parts of the ecosystem. And so I think for any company to, to be a unicorn and, and reach multi-billion dollar valuations, that's a necessity. You can't just support one part. You really have to support all parts of the ecosystem and support the growth throughout. Um, uh, and... Yeah, I think those are, and I think, you know, organic growth is important. We're in a unique period in the market right now. I know we're probably going probably to talk about public markets at some point here, um, but companies that are growing really fast organically, we're actually at a very unique um, uh, point in the public markets where valuations have corrected, um, and that brings a lot of uh, interesting M&A opportunities. And so what may have taken many, many years to reach the $100 billion mark, we could actually see acceleration towards that target uh, this year in particular as kind of valuations trickle down to earlier stage companies and it becomes a very attractive buying opportunity for some of these large cap educational technology tech companies. So. If I, yeah. <clears throat> sorry, just to piggyback on that, I think the um, you're not going to get an exceptional outcome in the space, whether it's 100 billion or you know make up your number without um, really appealing to consumers. And that's one of the challenges that we find in assessing ed tech companies. It's, a, it's an unusual space where often the payer is not the consumer. In, you know, I buy education products for my children that they generally hate because they're not designed with them in mind. Or as an employer, we buy education products for our employees. And that, that disconnect, I think, often holds back companies because the products are designed more for the payer than the end consumer, at least the ones we see today. It kind of builds back to Mercedes' point. I think to get that big outcome, somebody is gonna to have to start with a consumer, um, real strong consumer footing, and to your point, be mindful of the other constituents around the space, right? The payer, governments, 
things like that. But if it doesn't start with the consumer, it's going to be, I think it's going to be very hard to get the disproportionate outcome. And the ones that we've seen already that emerge, you mentioned Byju's, it starts with a strong consumer proposition that parents are willing to pay for. It's interesting. I, I was um, going to actually bring up the enterprise because when you think about companies like Salesforce, SAP, right, significant global enterprise software businesses that are solving real problems for businesses. And so for global corporations that can connect that the imperative to hit your business strategy goals is to solve your people strategy. If you could then make people at the heart of the organization, it's actually going to require a convergence of ed tech, HR tech, whatever, to come together and solve those people strategy needs. If that can happen, which I believe it can, then all of a sudden you could have a software as a service business servicing global corporations that can reach both the value that needs to be delivered and the valuation that we're starting to edge towards. We haven't seen it yet through the lens of ed tech but we certainly have seen it through the lens of enterprise software. And as corporations realize that the massive shift of skills that are required in this country to meet those business strategy needs, then I do think that that opens up an opportunity. When you think about the consumer side, there I think it, you know, it, we can kind of debate it, but it's interesting. So early childhood, it's a local business. We're not going to see those types of valuations, even though we're building important businesses. When you start thinking about the needs of the K-12 school systems locally, Hard to see it. When you start connecting the dots, though, between education and learning, especially experiential learning, and you think about, well, what would Disney be at $250 billion of value, the 40th largest company? Where would they be if they embraced learning, or if corporations, if, if education companies could embrace learning on that kind of a global scale and have that? Could they reach those levels? I don't know. I'm a bit of a skeptic. On, on the question, I think right now as a society we haven't prioritized education in the same manner we prioritized fun, right? And so are people going to want to blend their vacations with their learning? But it's going to have to be that convergence of travel, experience, learning, all coming together to get to that type of, you know, very, very large global, you know, education company. Yeah, and, and very interesting points, especially on the extension of LTV whether it's going to happen on, on early childhood, you know, middle school, high school, or college versus, you know, over, overlap with lifelong learning. I mean, arguably, the biggest potential is on the consumer side, you know, that bridge between college, higher education, getting into the jo job, uh, in, into the workforce, and then getting lifelong learning. It seems like that is the most natural way to create a massive business. I mean, you, you look at some of the most successful uh, LTVs out there, and we, we did some work around it. You know, Apple, for example. I mean, everybody is buying an iPhone every couple years and, and a MacBook every four or five years. That creates a massive LTV over time. Like, what can be done in education that kind of replicates that? I think you guys touched on a point that I think is important. The in within education, we can we continue to talk about this sector as defined by the physical institutions of the last several hundred years. It's elementary education, you know, middle school, high school, university. Like the big outcomes are going to come from likely a company that doesn't self-identify as an education company. It could be Disney. It could be somebody that comes from an entertainment lens. You know, we last year we acquired Stack Overflow, which is a um, you know if. I think Prashant's in the room, but when we met with the company, they didn't self-identify as an education company. They're in the software engineer workflow. It just happens their education moments happening in this community of the most attractive employee base of the world. I think that's a little bit of the barrier that the sector has. People say, I want to disrupt early education. I'm going after the university versus saying, here is where people want to learn. Or here's, here's an activity that's happening organically in my community. How do I foster it? There's, for whatever reason, this sector, as compared to other ones that, that I look at, is so wedded to the physical institutions of the past. And in order to get this disproportionate outcome, taking a consumer internet lens towards activity and say, what do people want versus what have we fed them before and what, how do we want to change it? And just to add to that, I completely agree with that. But I think winning the hearts and minds of consumers as early as possible is really key. And so when you think about, you know, looking something up on the internet, it's I'm going to go Google that. But 
having that top of mind as you think about uh, winning market share over in the eyes of a consumer, I think would be important as you kind of develop a, uh, a lasting brand and uh, you know getting in early because there's so much competition later in uh, later in life, but being the standard for learning and for education at an early stage, I think is important from a consumer perspective. I think like, I, I don't see a lot of companies that have that consumer at their core, right? Where as a consumer, I mentioned earlier, you know, I buy education products for my children. They don't own their data. They don't assess themselves. And as an employee, if you quit your job, it's likely that your data, your learning data stays with your employer. You know, somebody, I hope, that over time somebody will give the end consumer the power over their information the same way that you know, Netflix knows we, me well because I let Netflix know me well. Spotify, same kind of thing. That, that same, you know, this industry is held back by these barriers, these artificial barriers that get established. Somebody's gonna break that down. Yeah, but all these examples actually are great because in some way they're breaking these barriers and then for regulators or for traditional thinkers, it kind of changes the rules, right? And so today, interesting to hear how you all think about the regulations and are they enabling now companies to really be mega success stories? Or will there be some challenges as we've seen in certain geographies last year, for example? I mean, India lately has been actually quite a lot in the press with the success of so many companies so quickly and what are regulators doing for that or against that. So, Mercedes, how, I mean, I know you guys have a big focus on India or maybe talk about how you see the regulatory um, point of, of things as it relates to ad tech in either stage. Yeah, we have a separate team that runs our ND office. I don't work with the companies too closely, although, of course, shout out to Baiju's Teachment and a couple of others they've invested in, Nas Academy. I think Nas is, he might not be in here. Um, but in terms of, you mean regulation focused on India, or you mean regulation in the U.S.? I think uh, it's going to apply to anywhere, but obviously right now the hot topic is in India. But as you're just seeing, all these companies kind of disrupting the traditional degree or disrupting the K-12 system, what, what, what are your thoughts around regulations and on how, where, what do you see in different places that, that resonate? Yeah, I don't cover India, so don't do much, too much about the regulation there. Um, but I would say in the U.S., you know, we've been thinking through what is, at least in the higher education space, you know, people thought ISAs were going to become quite popular a couple of years ago. Those ended up having some regulatory hurdles and didn't quite catch on. I think then more recently with the pandemic, we saw the just amazing amount of, you know, stimulus that was sent companies in like in our portfolio um, out school, they didn't receive stimulus funding, but caught up by the same wave. Paper, not in our portfolio, got an, was an amazing beneficiary of this. I think that we're going to continue to see the governments thinking through how can we support education at a quick hit triage crisis response opportunity, but I actually don't think we can really rely on them for um, changing the forward-looking model. K-12 is falling apart right now in the US. Um, it's quite sad what's going on in the teacher burnout. And so we're more focused on anything that doesn't have to do with the regulation, and how do we think about, you know, to your point, Larry, the explicit versus implicit learning. We have been so stuck in explicit institution-based learning, but where do we drive more value from the implicit consumer learner activities that are already happening? And I think your point is a really good one. Like, how do we convince these non-ed tech companies that they are the front end, like TikTok, you are the education company. I've been speaking to the education team from there, and they're thinking about it Let's just turn that into the school of the future. I mean, in, at least domestically, regulation has been asymmetrically applied between the for-profit sector and the not-for-profit sector. And so, you know, here, it's very difficult to be a for-profit education um, operator in a regulated market. And so you've seen investors pull back from getting involved in, in for-profit delivery, um, delivery mechanisms, schools and otherwise. So their regulation has both helped put in perspective the need to have great outcomes, but also unfairly burden the, the, the for-profit sector in a manner that doesn't allow for innovation on that side. So we've all seen 
the money move towards service providers and software providers that are supporting the traditional institutions in absence of trying to be an operator themselves. And we could go, you know, you could go through whether it's space in the middle between the particular industries or whether it's at the industry level, but generally speaking, navigating the regulatory environment in, in the United States is something that I think most education companies have to wake up thinking about. You either your customers are regulated, your suppliers are regulated, even if you're not. And so how do you ensure that all of those stakeholders remain in good standing? Um, internationally, we've certainly, certainly seen governments get involved and destroy you know, some, some great players overnight. And so again, in those environments, it's very difficult. You could create value, but I'm not certain we're ever going to get to the valuations that you know, some of the non-regulated markets you know, have the benefit of getting to. When we first started investing in education, I explicitly like, gave the team the mandate, like, I don't want to touch anything that has a heavy government element, because that's, I mean, you're not going to see a lot of disruption coming with heavy government hands. That said, you know, in order to get the kind of outcomes you're talking about, you're talking about educating a nation's youth, right? You're talking about the economic outcome for a country. It's as you know, startups evolve and start to scale. I think that's that's one of the things that I've seen in the you know six seven years I've been looking at the space is that the entrepreneurs have to wake up to the government is going to have a say. They're going to have a role. Um, my best defense, hopefully, is building a good product and having strong consumer following and delighted customers. So I can't open with I'm going to solve a government problem, but I have to have be prepared for government relations. I have to be prepared to engage if I want to get to the, you know, deck of corn or hundred billion outcome that you tee up. I mean, I guess we'll just some of this. I mean, there's a couple of state regulations. Like if you're in California, you got to go through the BPPE, the um, post secondary, if you're an adult institution. But when I think all of a lot of the companies that went public last year, and you know, we didn't have hardly that many companies going public in ed tech for a long time before. A lot of them didn't really have that much interaction with the government. I mean, you to me, I don't believe, besides the post-secondary registration that they're going to have to do in every state, and similar with Coursera, of course they're working with universities, but do you feel like that the companies that get really big, that will get really far, have to deal with the government that much, what we're seeing so far of those billion dollar outcomes? At least from my perspective, like, so, you know, Udemy has a business in Udemy for government. So they sell into the government. I think to, to get to the really big outcomes, you're either going to um, be educating a lot of young people, and the government, frankly, should have a role. Um, and then to get to, like, big revenue scale, it's just natural. The government is going to have a role. Um, I don't think it's avoidable. I, I, I just wouldn't open with it. You know, open with delighting your customers, delighting your consumers, and then recognize that having a relationship with the government can be helpful. Um. Yeah, I mean, and, and certainly a big advantage was nobody expected what happened, you know, in March of 2020. And thanks God there were all these solutions for teachers, students, 1.6 billion teachers and students around the world suddenly had to use digital tools, had to learn digitally, had to teach online. And, and I think now what's happening is certainly the policymakers are getting their heads around and, and looking at how they can actually support that new ecosystem. That, that's, that was one of the, the problem, maybe one of the only gifts of the pandemic. When you talk about this, this odd dynamic that happens in ed tech, the gap between the consumer and the payer. I can tell you for the K-12 businesses, we have uh, one company, Brainly, that added 140 million users during the pandemic. And that wasn't all students, right? It was gonna be teachers and parents. And all of a sudden, this technology was being used in the background, and you get pulled in from the sidelines. I can tell you as a parent, I got pulled in from the sidelines, way more aware of the content my children were consuming. And I hope that's an indication of where this space goes, that it's not so, so siloed, that the consumer platforms are very separate and frankly not very good, but people are paying for them. Hopefully, it, it's a much more connected end-to-end -end experience. That's, that's where the space has to go. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, valuations, because that is on everybody's mind. And, and certainly, we've been going through some roller coaster uh, moments here in the last 12 months. You know, when we met here in August last year, it was kind of at the peak of, val of valuations. Coursera was close to a $60 price share. Uh, many others, you know, Udemy had come out, Duolingo was an IPO. 
Uh, today we are sitting here and, you know, every high growth tech stock has been, has corrected anywhere between 40 to 80 percent. Um, and usually what we've seen in previous cycles is when that happens in the public market, you see it happen in the private market with a six to eight month delay. Arguably now that's starting to happen in the private space. Uh, you know, rising interest rates, how is that going to kind of keep valuations here for the near future? But curious to, to, to kind of learn how you all think about longer term sustainable multiples of ad tech companies, assuming that all of this, what we discussed around long LTVs, you know, high retention rates, etc., plays out. How do you all think about when you make investments and you're underwriting on certain IRR over time? What kind of multiples do you think will be there in the next five to 10 years for ad tech? Maybe Chris? I'm happy to, I can kick us, off, I can kick us off on that. Um, so, you, you know, usually, as you said, when you have public market valuations come down, you, you, you sort of start to see a ripple through the private markets. I think we're at an interim phase right now, which is really propped up by the fact that there's still an abundance of capital sitting in the hands of, of firms and funds that have successfully raised capital and the debt markets that remain very robust and very fluid. So you have this counter prevailing force. So what happens first is transaction volumes come down, but valuations typically are, are right now are staying. So the highest quality of assets are still receiving some of the premium valuations that we've recently seen. But those companies that don't have all of those business metrics lined up, their processes are dragging or they're not trading. So volumes will come down, values will stay up. We will either see that the abundance of capital and the health of businesses rises again and we can hold valuation or we'll start to see the valuation sort of come down, um, come down market. So that's sort of you know, a little bit of the dynamic. I think if we had investment bankers on this panel, they certainly would want you to believe that now is still a good time to enter the market, right? <laughs> they would still want you to believe that there's comps there to support the valuations that you have. Um, in the at, right now, growth is still in favor but in the absence of a business model that architects down to something that is profitable and self-sustaining, you're not going to continue to see people put capital in where they know there's going to be follow-on rounds because there's all of that risk of dilution. So the path to profitability matters more than it mattered 12 months ago. It should always matter, don't get me wrong, it should always matter. But sometimes market forces lose sight of that and growth is overvalued. And that is certainly what we've all experienced most recently. Yeah, I can comment too. So I'm mostly on the growth stage. So I, I do investments $50 million and above that are typically in later stage companies. And uh, the market is, is kind of at the perfect storm right now. So we have uh, inflation, we have rising rates, which are historically really bad for growth stocks. Um, and of course, we have macro concerns with Russia invading Ukraine. And so it's, uh, it's an interesting time to be an investor. And it's an interesting time to uh, kind of guide your portfolio companies because we've been on a you know, decade plus bull market um, for most of my career. Uh, and so uh, really what the market is telling uh, all companies right now is that cash is king and cash conservation should be top of mind. And so the pendulum, as you had mentioned, has shifted more towards cash conservation and uh, less towards growth. And that changes every few years, right? But I think it's, it's one of those extreme moments right now in the market. Um, I think on the, the flip side, what's interesting is the IPO market has been very muted. And so I, I was actually an investment banker for about a decade at Morgan Stanley prior to joining SoftBank. And this is, an, I, this is a tricky IPO market. It's unlike anything that I've, I've seen before. And when you look at the, the performance of the IPO tech IPO cohorts in, in 2021, what's interesting is if you looked at kind of the top performers, call it five years ago, that, that bucket would actually be um, in a year's time, call it up 70, 80 percent um, since, since going public. And if you look at that now, it's actually about down 10%, which means that for every deal that's gone out, even the top ones, investors have lost money in the public markets. And so, so that trickles down uh, into private markets as well. And uh, it takes a, a longer 
longer time to reach the earlier stage, but we're definitely feeling the pain in, uh, in some of the crossover rounds and then also in, in the public uh, companies that have yes, yet to reach a, a path to profitability or are still even a negative. Um, but again, hope that it will shift, but I do think that mar down markets like this, uh, when valuations have corrected, uh, it's a normal part of, of um, being an investor, but I think it, it presents a lot of interesting opportunities for companies that have um, been more conservative on, on cash burn to actually start investing in acquiring new assets. I guess the, the only thing that I would add to that, it, it's, it's, we're in that phase where the private companies, I'm sure many of them in the room, think that they're immune from what's gone on in the public markets. And it's hard to articulate a case that says this funding environment is better for my company, no matter how special your company is, that it's better than it was six months ago. And so to your point, the, the thing that we're encouraging our companies to do is to take another look at your strategic priorities, your investment priorities. You still have the same company you had. It's just in order to fund those things that you want to do, it's going to take longer and potentially be more punitive from a dilution standpoint. It's okay. Just acknowledge that. The scary thing is when people think, no, it's those public market you know, numbers that you cite, th th that's not me. That, that, that's a different market. My company's special. I mean, in some ways, some of them are right. I mean, there, there's, it still feels in venture, like people are taking crazy pills every day. I saw a company the other day that was valued over a billion in you know, 10 to 20x revenue in the ed tech space um, when you know, comps like Coursera and Udemy are trading at one and a half to you know, maybe 3x. And so it's it's very confusing um, what's going on. I think that for quality um, quality teams, but also exceptional fundraisers and storytelling, the founders who are really good at that, it's just all the more important. They're the ones who can fundraise through a bear market, and it's a really special skill because it does feel crazy. And the companies that are being rewarded in the public markets do have, uh, you know, their forward-looking estimates are quite accurate. They do have a good visibility into their pipeline of, uh, of revenue and do have kind of, uh, you know, a better handle on cost controls than others. And so not there, it has been, you know, a disproportionate uh, impact on companies that do not have that. But it's, uh, it's a very trying time to be a, a private company. But I, I do think the advice that, that I'm hearing in the boardroom and that I'm giving in the boardroom is, is really it's cash conservation time. Yeah, and certainly there will be a lot of uh, consolidations happening here very soon, just given that, you know, you had this massive amount of uh, funding over the last many years, and, and, yeah, certainly some of them will not be sustainable. And um, There's a lot of people here at this conference trying to acquire companies right now, so go meet them. <laughs> yep. Um, and then maybe lastly, just on the, on the exit itself, I mean, traditional IPO, direct IPO, which a few tech companies did really well with Spotify, Palantir, Slack a couple years ago. SPACs obviously boomed last year, although a huge percentage of that might be uh, really poor quality SPACs. And so there's, going, going on some fil there's some filtering going on right now. But how do you all see, do you think in the future there's going to be all these three options that the entrepreneurs will be choosing, investors like you will be recommending, or do you think we'll go back to kind of a traditional, traditional IPO as an exit uh, for companies to be public? Any thoughts? Um, I think in a couple, two thoughts. I'll give you two thoughts. One is, one is um, SPACs were an attempt to innovate a very elongated path to being a publicly traded business. And that innovation served a moment in time. It's about going through a reset. Something else will emerge. The process to go through an SEC-regulated path to being a publicly traded business is very onerous. That, that it serves a function to make sure that it screens out companies that aren't prepared for durable public company standards. However, we all saw pre the SPAC environment that the number of successful publicly traded businesses came down. We as a society, as an economy, are stronger if we have a very strong public market activity where retail investors have access to the same type of investment opportunity that we have on the private side. And so finding innovation to allow companies a path into the public domain I think is very important and we'll see furthering of innovation on that. As a private sector investor, um, despite the fact that we have a 
finite privilege of being involved in a organization, right? We are contractually required to sell at some point in time. So this finite purpose is a, ma is a mandatory activity set. But despite that, we try to have that mentality that we're, we're in business together forever. It allows you to make longer term decisions. And if that's the case, then the goal is to become strategically relevant in the community or in the market you served. And then the organizations that are either bigger than you, as an organization and company, or from a capital perspective, they then want to own you. That's the holy grail from our perspective of what it takes to build a, a business that has endurance to it. And so we don't sit there and say, how do we back into a public event? How do we back into a private sale? We think about points of strategic relevance, durability, product market fit, and long-term decisions that then strengthen the innovation of the business. One, which is one quick thing. I mean, this is going to sound crazy, but I think we also have to consider what if companies don't go public. In particular, thinking about, you know, I was on a Web3 panel yesterday, Lightspeed, we've invested $600 million into crypto companies recently. And if you think about token tokenization and the ability to liquidate very quickly for investors and for the company to have a liquid opportunity, most of our crypto companies are probably never going to go public. And while we're extremely early in learning meets crypto, I think that is a very big possibility in the next decade. So we'll see. Yep. Yeah, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, but certainly, we're probably going into the Web3 metaverse very soon. Uh, it's a big theme on the, here at the summit. So I want to thank my wonderful panelists and all of you for being here. Thank you. <laughs>